We ready? Yeah. Okay. Well, good morning. It's really very nice to be here. Very thankful to be able to um, present a series of lessons to you on the greatest commands uh, in action. Uh, this is part of a, a series um, that I have done uh, at Centerpiece uh, in on, on a couple of occasions uh, where they have uh, met to really talk about how scripture speaks to the LGBTQ uh, population and how do we think about um, the people that we know in that population, how is should the church be responding? M much of this are, are are things that I'm sure you have heard uh, before. So some of this may not be new. Uh, what might be new uh, for some of you is uh, the work that's been done on uh, what we call systematic othering, uh, which is a way in which people either consciously or unconsciously uh, begin to categorize individuals and marginalize them, either in a society, a group, an institution, or even a church. And so what I would like to do uh, in this series of four lessons is really start um, with a foundation that both Old and New Testaments lay in terms of what is our responsibility to our neighbor. And where how, how does it get articulated, both in Old and the New Testament, and then what does that mean for how we enact that um, to all people, really, that we come in contact with? Um, so I wanted to start uh, this morning just by giving you a roadmap for what we're going to be doing for the next four weeks uh, to give you an idea of, of how this study will go. Um, today, I want to talk about um, the greatest commandments that we uh, that Jesus articulates, and I want to talk about their uh, origins in the Hebrew Bible or our Old Testament. Um, that is my particular discipline, uh, I, is um, uh, Hebrew Bible studies. And so I'd like for us to, to go into the Old Testament and see where we find what Jesus pulls out as the, the greatest command in the second, which is like it. Where do we see that in the Old Testament? <clears throat> what did it mean back then? And then how does Jesus use it? Right. And I think that can give us a um, some pretty interesting insights. Um, next week, we're going to talk about the problem of what we call systematic othering, um, which is how are people systematically marginalized. Again, it can be anything from a family, a group, an institution, or even a church. There's been a, a lot of work done on this um, in Holocaust research, which is also um, a field that I uh, have studied and taught in. And there's a lot from history that we can learn about how this works. Um, and we can even learn a lot from Hollywood, believe it or not. Uh, if we look at the history of film and the history of theater, uh, which is one of our most, most public ways that we talk about community is in movies and in theater. Um, we've got some things we can we can learn uh, from the film and theater industry about how this works. Um, and then in week three, we're going to specifically talk about uh, the LGBTQ um, population, what their needs are, um, the kinds of things that they face uh, from from uh, churches and their experience, and how I believe and how I think scripture, uh, counters this othering. It's just a, that how we can shift our, our focus a bit to meet the needs that they have. Uh, and then in the last week, we're going to talk about um, how we go and do something, how we go and do this. Um, because, you know, as a, as a teacher of scripture, um, and I was a minister for, for about 20 years before I was in academics, the, um, but in, and especially even in the in the academy, even in school, there's always this point where you come to after you've studied and studied and studied, and the question is, okay, so what do I do with this? You know, what does it mean? What do I go? What am I supposed to go do with this knowledge? Right? Um, 
And so we're going to, I want us to think about that each week, but in particular on the last week, I want us to have a discussion about, okay, so now what do we go and do with what we've been talking about, right? Because um, remember, that's in when Jesus talks about the, uh, the the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? The last phrase in that whole story is what? Go and do likewise, right? So that's that's the clincher, right? So what do we go and do? So this morning, uh, let's start with that, with just looking at what you know uh, this what we call the greatest command is. Um, I have found when I talk about this or when I see it or when I watch it play out in um, different religious communities, it gets reduced often to something like love God and love neighbor, right? Which is good. I mean, that's great, right? Easy to remember. But there's other things that go on in this passage that I think are really important. So let's just read it. Um, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. It says, teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Okay. Um, again, very familiar passage, but I, I want us to notice if, if we were to put this in on stage, right? If we were to turn this into a dialogue that we could watch, we would have uh, Jesus talking to a group of legal experts right, which is what the Pharisees were, uh, this group has heard that another group has been silenced, and now Jesus comes into the middle of this fairly high-powered discussion that has gone on, right? The stakes are high here, right? Um, and so one of them has the, you know, the, the nerve to say, all right, so I, I'm, we're going to talk about this, right? This is a test, right? Which of commandment in the law is the greatest? Now, a thing to notice about this question is when we're talking about when a, when a set of Hebrew Jewish lawyers in the time of Jesus would have been asking this question, and re they refer to the law, right? The term law and prophets is uh, a code, really. It's a way of talking about what scripture would have been in that time, right? So um, you might have said in our language, teacher, which commandment in the Bible is the greatest, right? It, it's the equivalent of a big arc, right? Uh, so Jewish author or people have um, codified uh, 613 individual laws or mitzvot in, in the Hebrew Bible. That's a lot of laws, right? So, okay, so you got 613 of these things. Which one is the greatest? Which one is the most important, right? How are you going to choose? So this is a high stakes question. And so Jesus says, well, the first one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest. And then there's a second one that's like it, right? No, underline like, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right. And so Jesus is saying there's two that qualify as the most important and they're linked. Right. They're not different. They're linked. It's, it's not like Jesus is saying, well, the first commandment is go bring the right kind of sacrifice. And the second is go pay your taxes. All right. I mean, those two could be related. They're, they're not really. Jesus doesn't this doesn't even mention taxes ever really in this, but uh, the, the whole point is that these two are linked. And then he says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That's a huge statement, right? So you've got this body of law, this body of scripture that Jesus is saying, if you really want to know what's important here, right? What does all this hang on? In other words, 
what does it all mean in the end, right? Um, what's the what are the Jenga blocks <laughs> that if you pull one of them out, the whole thing collapses, right? And he says, well, it's these two things, right? If you want to know what the law and the prophets, if you want to know what scripture, if you want to know what our body of teaching means, it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and your mind and your neighbor as yourself. That's it. Right? I would have loved to see the reactions of all the people. I mean, that is something I I, I would love to see that on stage, right? Like what would what 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 reaction would they have had? So if Jesus pulls these two out, let's go look at where he found them, right? Because they were in the law first. And so they come from two places, one in Deuteronomy and one in Leviticus, right? So in Deuteronomy, we're going to look at each one of these individually. But the Deuteronomy 6 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That would be the equivalent of the first. And then the second, love your neighbor as yourself, is found in Leviticus, right? Right in the middle of what is known as the holiness code um, in the book of Leviticus, which is a series of laws that are uh, particularly chapter 19, where we find uh, uh, the law saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's found in a group of laws that are linked to the authority of God to describe how people are to act towards your neighbor. Right? It's not a random law. It's in a very specific group. And so in Leviticus 19.18, the full verse is, you shall not take vengeance or bear grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. All right. So again, uh, th this is not a throwaway line. <laughs> this is a very important piece, right? That the tag at the end, I am the Lord, is the, the Levitical way of saying these laws have their heart and foundation in the in in our God Yahweh, right? They're, they're not tied to a king, which would have been very common in the ancient Near East. They're not tied to an organization or an institution. They're tied in the very person of who Yahweh is. And this is what Yahweh says we should do, right? Um, now notice, and when we'll, we we'll talk about this in a minute, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go into it more, but I, just to begin, I just want you to notice how you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What's it put next to? You shall not take vengeance. You shall not bear a grudge. In other words, Part of loving our neighbor is as ourself is not harboring things, judgments, ills against people, right? Um, so let's unpack each one of these and see what they have to say. Um, before we do that, I'd like for us to see how these two command these two commandments that Jesus teaches um, line up against the other really big passage in the Old Testament, um, which are the Ten Commandments, which is something most everybody knows. If you look at the, I've reduced these for the sake of uh, being able to show them as a graphic, uh, but if you take a look at the Ten, right, that, that are articulated in Exodus, they're articulated in Deuteronomy, you find them the same commandments, you find them in Leviticus, you find them in Romans, right? A part of them in Romans. No other gods before me, no images, no lifting God's name into emptiness, remembering the Sabbath, right? The Sabbath means a day of stopping. Honor father and mother, no killing, no adultery, no stealing, no very false witness, no coveting, right? That's the, if we take a look at that and the structure of it, the first three have to do with loving God with all of your heart, soul, and strength. The last six have to do with what it means to love your neighbor, right? And the middle one, remembering the Sabbath, um, is that place where these two come together, right? So if you think about the language of the Sabbath, 
which is six days you have to do all your work, but on the seventh, right? Um, <clears throat> the Sabbath is a Shabbat means to stop, right? So it's a day of stopping in the midst of busyness, right? So if you put, if you were to put the Sabbath on a timeline, right, you've got work, 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 stop, right? Work, 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 work. So, so the Sabbath is an interruption. And on that day of interruption, that is the time when you're not doing any work that we that you can refocus on relationship with God and relationship to others, right? Now, I think this is, um, if, if first is love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? Which is no other gods before me, don't make images, um, treat God with with respect, that is going to then provide the framework for how we are to treat others, honoring parents, don't go around killing people, you know, uh, don't go around taking other people's um, um, adultery here has to do with um, husbands and, and wives, don't go stealing, which interesting has to do with kidnapping, actually, um, don't go bearing false witness, be fair in your judgments and no coveting, right? Um, these were things that would have been important for building Israelite society in the time. These were the things that have been, that if you, you do these, you're not going to have a good life together as a community. So I want to, um, we'll come back to this a little bit more, but I want to give you a good illustration of or what I think is a good illustration of how important uh, putting God first is in relationship to everything else that follows, right? It's the same thing. Jesus is saying the same, putting in the same order. But um, how many of you all, I'm saying one, two, three, four, five, several people in here, including myself, we put on button-up shirts today, right? So if if you're getting dressed and you put the top button in the right hole, what are the chances that all the other ones will fall in line? <laughs> Pretty good, right? But what if you get the top button buttoned wrong, like I do this, right? Then what are my chances of getting all the other buttons in the right hole? Not at all good, right? So this is the whole point. Right. If you get the top button buttoned right, right. If if you get the, the, the shirt started right, if you get the top command right, you've got pretty good chances that the rest are going to fall in line. If you get the if you don't have God straight first, the neighbor's gonna be a mess. Right. And a lot of times I think that is part of the problem is we try to deal with neighbor before we know who God is. All right, we get that mixed up. Now, here's the other thing about the commandments. The first one has to do with what is most important to you and to God, right? No other gods before me, right? What's the last one? No coveting, which in coveting has to do with desire, jealousy, wanting things, right? It's, it's that desire gone wrong in us, right? It's the whole garden story, right? So what if you start at the bottom and read up? If you put yourself at the top, right? In other words, you start with, I'm going to live the way I want. I want this. I want all these things. I'm going to go get them. Then that's a recipe for just breaking everything all on, on the way up, right? So if you put yourself, we put ourselves first in terms of our understanding how life is supposed to work then it's going to be a bit of a disaster right <laughs> trying to get everything else put into place and and here's the thing about commandment breaking you it's like eating potato chips it's you never eat just one <laughs> nobody ever breaks just one commandment right i mean if if you start with desire there are going to be a whole bunch of them right? I think David's a great example, right? Desired Bathsheba. So let's just count the commandments, right? Killing, adultery, right? Dishonor, 
right? I mean, you, the, the false witness, right? I mean, it just it just keeps going, right? So I don't want to belabor this too much, but I think it's important to see the structure, right? That that what God has to say about how we treat other people, that I am the Lord peace, this is not optional, right? It, it's not optional in the Old Testament and it's not optional in the New Testament, right? Um, this business of treating neighbor fairly is a really big deal. And it comes out of our relationship with God. If, if we're not in tune with the heart of God, we can't be in tune with how to really treat our neighbor well, right? That's the point for today uh, about that. So let's go to Deuteronomy. Look at Deuteronomy for a bit. Deuteronomy, uh, there's a part of Deuteronomy, chapter six, verse four through nine, that's called the Shema, right? Shema in Hebrew is hear, O Israel, right? It's a call to listen up. You know how like when you're on your base, you're play, ever played sports, you have a coach, coach, everybody's running wild. The coach says, okay, listen up. I want you to hear this, right? You don't listen up, you're in trouble. Well, that's the Shema. Right? So he's saying to people, listen up, folks. I want to tell you what's important, right? Now, this speech that's made by Moses comes directly after Moses' recitation of the Ten Commandments given on Sinai and Deuteronomy, right? So in this, the, the way the rhetoric works in Deuteronomy, you have Moses who is, who is telling the people, okay, this is what's important. The law has been given. This is what's important. This is how we go forward. The, the Shema comes right at the beginning. And so when the very first thing is, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our the Lord is our God, right? No other gods before me. The Lord alone. There are no others, right? It's a reiteration of the that first commandment. And then he says, "You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might," right? And then he gives them a way to think about this and enact it. Uh, on a daily basis. Keep these commandments in your heart, recite them to your children, talk about them, and so on. Um, what I want us to do is, is unpack um, this command about what does that mean? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. What, what is that? All right, well, let's take a look. Um, the heart. Um, I'm using Duolingo characters, by the way, because um, I'm doing German right now and I'm into Duolingo. <laughs> um, so the heart in the in the Hebrew world, the, the heart was the center of the will, right? It, it's not feeling based, right? It's it's your ability to it's your agency. I call it your decision-making ability. It's your, it's what you do when you make choices. It's in your heart, right? You choose to do something. Now, for us, when we talk about, you know, I love you and we have the heart emoji and all, this is all feeling based, right? And it's really interesting um, with the exception of the Psalms in the Old Testament, you really don't know how people feel about things. I mean, a couple of times it bleeds through. Um, you know when God's angry, right? And, and but you you don't really know a lot about how people feel. That's because this really isn't about feelings. It's about choice, right? And it's about will, right? The whole story of the Garden of Eden is the revelation of oh wow. Guess what? We know the difference between good and evil now. We have choices to make, right? So love the Lord your God with all your heart has to do with choosing to put God first, right? Love him in your choices, in your will, with your agency. Um, so this is a messy this is a messy one because the word in English means so many different things, right? But in Hebrew, the word is nefesh. And nefesh is 
your whole being. It's your living, breathing humanness. It's what God creates in Genesis chapter two, verse seven, when he makes uh, when he makes the first human, right? He creates a living nephesh, right? Which is a living, breathing being. It's the dirt um, that he picks up and he forms and he makes the Adam and then he breathes into it life. And this is the living being. Right. So I, I think of the nefesh as your, it's your basic humanity. It's all of you. Right. It doesn't exclude anything. Um, and it's the, it's, it's your body. It's the physical, it's the mental, it's the emotional, it's the, the, even the, the breath of life. It's all of that. Right. So it's different then the way Greeks talk about, which is a lot of times how we talk about the body, is that we have our uh, we have our physical mind, and then we have our physical body, and then we have, you know, the emotions are over here, right? They're kind of separated the way we talk about it. Um, but in the Hebrew world, it's not. It's a whole being. So to love the Lord your God with all of your nefesh means everything all of it right uh there's not any part that gets separated out right and we get in trouble i think when we start trying to deal with our our relationships with our neighbors when we start talking about parts you know i mean we're talking about whole people right you're a whole person if I'm relating to you, I'm relating to everything about you, right? I, I can't just um, say, well, I'm, I'm going to relate to the part of you that, um, I don't know, likes Doritos, or I'm, I'm going to relate to the part of you that that I can relate to. I'm going to choose that. And the, the rest of you, I'm just going to pretend like, no, when you're relating to your neighbor, you're relating to a whole being that's human, that's God made, that breathes just like we do. Um, then the last one, which is really fun, is your strength. Now, this is in many ways untranslatable from Hebrew because the word there is ma'od, which is, which literally means very. Like, you know how when you say something, and I'll explain it this way, you know, when you see something, you say, oh, that is, that, that's good but you want to put a lot of emotion behind it. So you say, that's very good, right? You know what you mean by very? Love God with that, right? I think the kids today call it extra. And they say, that was really extra, you know, or that, that was over, we might say over the top, or it's some way to describe that exuberant, that energy that is is somehow shown and made visible, right? So it's love God with that, right? That, that it's still part of your nefesh, but it's a visible part. So when you put all of these three things together, there's nothing that's left out, right? It's your ability to choose, it's your whole body, and then your excess, whatever's excessive, Love God with that. And by the way, in the, the Hebrew scriptures, it's a very physical language. It's very embodied, right? It's not stiff. It's not Victorian, right? It's it's very embodied, right? Uh, there's loads of excess just spilling out all over the, the Old Testament, which makes it fun to study because you can't categorize almost anybody. They're always spilling out in places. But that's the ma'od. That's love God with that. Right. So with all of that in mind, let's go to what Jesus says is now that we've got love God with all of this. Now, what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? Right. Now, if I have all of this humanness, so does my neighbor. Right. My neighbor is like me in my humanity. 
And so the language here in Hebrew is, you shall love your neighbor. And the language is, as yourself is really in English, it's kind of a reduction. It's really love your neighbor as the one who is like you, right? Meaning your neighbor. So the focus is on shared humanity, right? I don't love my neighbor because we have common interests, or I don't love my neighbor because we're the same race. I don't love my neighbor because we talk the same language, right? Those are parts of us. But the, the meaning here is God created us all to be fully embodied and human. And we're all the same in that way, right? And so that's the focus. Now that makes a difference, right? When we start talking with people or relating to people who have very different mind understandings or very different bodies or very different emotions, right? That's all part of the creative difference but none of that strips away the very essence of what it means to be human. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And this is why it's really important to understand how it is that very good, well-meaning groups, people, individuals can systematically learn how to dehumanize another person. Right? I mean, this happens all the time in history, right? It it tries to make other, for some reason, when we can't, not learning how to relate to somebody, right? Fully as God would have us do, um, what we do is figure out reasons why we don't have to relate to them. And we do that by making them less than human, right? Now, how does that happen? Because it doesn't start off that way. I don't think anyone, well, I'll take that back. There's always an exception. <laughs> um, most people, right, don't start off, um, don't start off wanting to systematize others, but they're taught how to do that through different things in society, right? Um, a, a really I think a, a really good, easy, accessible way to get at, the, to see this portrayed visually is that movie, um, that 1967 movie, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, right? I mean, you you see an example of, um, of someone who is able to do it and all the different ways people don't do it, right? But this is the thing we wanna get at um, about how does that systematic othering happen because it completely goes against everything God teaches us about how to relate to people. Um, so uh, in kind of by way of summary, and then I've got a couple of questions. Um, our love for God is inextricably linked to love for neighbor, right? Those two things are not different. We can't separate them, right? If you want to see a prophet of God in the Bible, go non-linear, right? Just go crazy, right? Put the prophet in a situation where the people are worshiping God and treating their neighbors terribly, right? The prophet will then, that is what activates much of the prophetic voice. A great example of that is Isaiah chapter one, right? Go to Isaiah chapter one, you've got some of the strongest language in all of scripture about how God hates it when the people of God try to come before God and worship, but yet are abusing and treating their neighbors terribly, right? You've got 66 chapters of Isaiah going crazy, right? Uh, because this is just wrong, right? It, 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 it's just not the way it's supposed to be. So these two things are linked. Right. In the Hebrew scriptures, faith is never a noun. It's always a verb. Right. You, we don't talk in the Hebrew scripture. We don't talk about the faith. You talk about acting faithful or being faithful. Right. So your trust in God, your relationship to God must translate into action. 
right? And if it doesn't, there's something wrong. Um, experiencing God is found in the inner human relationship, right? When we relate to others in the way God would have us to do it, we, in fact, experience who God is, right? Um, there's a French Talmudic scholar philosopher, uh, Emmanuel Levinas, who in this great article called Difficult Freedom, um, he has this one line, to know God is to know what must be done, right? Which is said in many different ways in the Old and New Testament, right? But it's like, if we claim to have faith, then we're doing things for people, right? It's that we're, we're, we're engaged in that relationship. Um, so in the time we have left, I've got some four kind of questions um, here. I'm op open it up. Um, you know, maybe you would like to share an experience of growing closer to God through serving someone. Um, how do you experience shared humanity? What practices help us to see others? What practices hinder or something something else? I'd just be interested in your thoughts. Experiences. Yes. Good. Some time ago, uh, I volunteered for the uh, Board of Education for Blind. And I was assigned a gentleman who, whom I helped. Uh, and this is the first time I did something for someone else without asking anything back. Uh, I, I was brought up in the Catholic system, nothing to say bad about Catholicism, but it didn't relate to me. And I remember for the longest time, longest time, my attitude towards life was what's in it for me. Mm. In the relationship, work, I was the best negotiated for the best salary because it was always what's in it for me? What can you do for me? Mm. And it took a long time to turn this around. And the example I'm saying was, I was helping the gentleman to do the daily kind of shopping, taking him to appointment because he couldn't drive. He was legally blind. And I remember coming back from one of those uh, visits with him, driving, singing, happy on the, like I won a million. Yeah. And I couldn't understand. What happened? Nothing changed in my life. But doing something for mm -hmm. someone else, yeah. that's the healing of that peace. Mm -hmm. And I literally mm -hmm. felt like one with God. Yeah. That was something that changed my life. But I know that, that when I volunteered for it, it was God's inspiration. Now, I experienced the otherness almost on a daily basis because of my accent. I wasn't born here. So quite often I labeled very quickly. Mm -hmm. People say, where are you from? And I'm Polish, right there, <laughs> a label. And I, I lived with it for a long, long time. And mm -hmm. it was quite difficult to love that neighbor who would just labeled me in, the, uh, in that way. Mm -hmm. But just being here and listening and learning, it's really brought me a long, long way from that time. So oh, thank, you. That. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It's beautiful. Well, yes, sir. I'm going to poke at the last one. And, and a lot of the problems we have are the way everyone is raised when, mm -hmm. you, you know, when we teach our children you know that person is strange don't go near them mm -hmm. and we do this in a positive way but unfortunately it ends up being carried to like it be, ends up being carried to the extreme you know anyone who is strange or different we can mm -hmm. here yes so we have to figure out that that line between safety and and forbearance, or I can't find the right word for the other the other side of that line. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you bringing that up because next week when we talk about the the systematic othering, this gets at exactly what you're saying. That's a very good point that you made. I mean, and this and this is not something that's new. This is tribal. 
Mm -hmm. This yes. goes back to what yes. we were living in caves, and that other tribe might be taking our food. Mm -hmm. But now we don't have to worry about that food, but that that part of our brain is still there going, right. that other so, tribe might be taking our food. food. Yeah. So what do we do with the other tribe? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, John? Uh, I think of uh, practicing empathy out of, this, out of the desire to share our humanity with others who we perceive as being different in some way or another, but with empathetic thinking, we strive to understand what those perceptions are all about. Are we really different? Or are we really sharing and humanity together? And when we when we get when we do those things, we realize we're not so different. We're all children of God. And we're much happier knowing. Yes. Yep. That's great. Yes. I, I think one of the most damaging things I grew up with was that somehow associating with someone who is not like you and practices something you don't understand at all is somehow an indictment of your own personal integrity. Mm -hmm. It's simply not true. Mm -hmm. Jesus did it all the time, didn't change his personal integrity. And it shouldn't change ours either. And I think actually that whole idea is a lie and it's a misappropriation because when we when we when we do get through that to learn how to connect with other people, then all of a sudden we understand that all these declarative things that churches say about individuals may not be true. Right. And and the, if you hear someone making a declarative statement about a group in a from a pulpit of a church, your antenna had better go up very quickly. Sure. Because what they're not saying is this is the truth. What they're saying is don't have anything to do with that other individual. Because once you do, you may figure out that they're as human as you are. Right. And then somebody loses their control. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we got one more, and then what time is up? Yeah. Um, I was so fortunate to have a career in a children's hospital, and it was a in here in the metropolitan New York area, and it attracted patients from all over the world of all different backgrounds. And I had a young child that was of Muslim faith, and the mother was there with the child, and. I was the teacher, and the other child had had a serious, serious injury, brain injury, and just a movement was joyful. And the whole time I'm with the child, the mother was reading the Quran and moving her body in a way that was very uncomfortable for me. And she had limited English. And they actually had come to this country to get medical care for their child. And at the end of the session, the mother was able to relate to me that she was praying that God give me the strength and what was necessary to help her child. And it was so moving. Wow, that's marvelous. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, okay. Uh, Charles, thank you so much for leading us this morning. And we look forward to several more Sundays together. Um, thank you. We're going to press uh, pause on the recording.